<laughs> Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. Meetings called to order. Um, and I'll call for a motion and say, I'm sorry, let me confirm. I think we have Commissioner Strader on. Okay. Um, I'll call for a motion and second to grant a leave of absence to Commissioner Lamb, who's out of town. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the minutes. I'll call for a motion and second for approval of the minutes of the regular commission meeting of January 11th, 2023. So moved. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Motion carries. Um, Curtis, we will move on to your executive director's report. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, guests, commissioners, uh, new employees in particular. I want to welcome in the back couple of rows there. We just got a chance to say hello, and I got to spend a little time with them last week. Really nice to see you all here this morning. Uh, let me start by acknowledging our safety champions for the month, who I hope will be up here shortly. Uh, four employees uh, across the organization, Amanda, Dan, Julia, and Aaron. Uh, some great stories here. Um, Dan out at uh, Marine Security, just a, a, a really good job handling a diff difficult uh, trespassing situation. Uh, uh, citizen who uh, was really hard to manage. This is a situation we've discussed, uh, commissioners, uh, uh, both our police and our maintenance teams uh, and our security teams struggle with uh, increasingly in the region. And Dan did just a great job. Uh, Aaron is a, a marine electrician who actually devised a mechanism to help make the testing of plug-in uh, containers at T6 safer for employees. Just some really great stories here, and uh, it's nice to, to see them. I'm going to ask Don Chestelson uh, to thank you, Don, um, who runs our navigation team to give us a safety message for the day. Good morning. Are you on there, Don? Is your uh, something I need to do here? Oh, now you go. There we go. <clears throat> Live. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm accountable, uh, Don Chelson, Director of Navigation, and I'm accountable for occupational safety and health throughout our navigation operations along the Cumbly River, as well as our base operations on Swan Island. Today's safety message highlights our safety journey towards zero injuries at navigation. Navigation is comprised of approximately 46 employees tasked with working under a U.S. Army, Army Corps of Engineers contract to help maintain the necessary channel depth in the Columbia River for safe ship, ship passage. The following groups provide the necessary report. The Dredge Oregon, Dredge Tender Boats, which include the Williams, Ivanov, Clackamas, Orin, Green, and the Deliverance, shore operations for placement of dredge material and the Swan Island base. Navigation combines the port's key safety and health program attributes of committed and visual leadership and engaged employee involvement with our safety management system leading indicators of hazard reporting enablement for all employees, shameless incident reporting and analysis of facts for continuous improvements, tracking the corrective actions of all safety issues to closure to and sharing the lessons learned to elevate and continuously prove our safety health uh, safety our employee safety and health my leadership team which includes two dedicated safety professionals tracks several leading indicators to ensure our safety processes are working these safety metrics are healthy and improving rapidly over the past year in fact i'm happy to announce our our safety uh, reporting incident ratio goal, the bird triangle of 20 to one, we're exceeding that uh, six months into the year, we're currently at 21.1, so it's working. I'm also pleased to, to announce that navigation has operated for the last 12 months with just three OSHAble recordable injuries. Employee safety and health is a continuous improvement process toward operational excellence. I continue to be engaged with the business team to support and enable the successful completion of our fiscal year 23 safety plans, advancing the awareness of the safety, uh, advancing the awareness that safety is not just the absence of injuries. Safety is the present, uh, presence of resilient defenses. Thank you. Thanks, Any Don. Questions? Appreciate it. 
I know uh, several commissioners were out uh, last month at the dredge and just the complexity and the difficulty of that work and the, the great talent on the team I really appreciate the focus on safety. So thanks, Don. Um, it, commissioners, just uh, a bit of a word about PDX next. Um, I think I mentioned last month we had a sneak peek um, sort of behind the wall for 150 port and PDX employees. Um, it was a great opportunity for small groups to walk around under the new nine acre roof made entirely out of Douglas fir, uh, straight from sustainably managed forests in Oregon and Washington, all sourced within 300 miles uh, of PDX. Uh, one employee spoke for all of us who said it's more beautiful than I could have imagined. And I know many of you have been under it too. When you see it, it's really astonishing. Um, so as a reminder, that roof and the area under it will be open in May of 2024. So uh, just over a year from now. Speaking of the roof, uh, the U.S. Forest Stewardship Council recently recognized the PDX Next uh, program's deep commitment to responsible wood sourcing with a 2022 Leadership Award for the Port, ZGF, Sustainable Northwest, and Timber Lab, um, really focusing on the FSC certified glue lamb beams and lattice, these really iconic features in the uh, new main terminal. A couple of announcements. Uh, starting in June, British Airways is going to increase their service to one flight per day between PDX and London Heathrow. The route is going to use a larger 777-200 aircraft, so really great news. It's the first of a kind to have a 777 here, so pretty, pretty exciting for us. Um, and finally, I'd like to wrap up, if I can, if we're ready, a video focused on the accessibility project I mentioned, uh, Good PDX, I mentioned last month in my comments. Our communications team, um, coupled with our partners, has put together this great video describing the program. So, um, Madam President, with your permission, we'll just show a quick video here. As an airport community, we're putting a lot of thought and intention into the work that we're doing around accessibility. We came together and, and thought about how we wanted to try to make the airport as accessible as we could and to create as much engagement as possible with all of our community partners, including them as we're making decisions both for the future as well as for where we're at right now, both from a services and an infrastructure perspective. We're trying to think about who's at the table, who's not at the table, who's burdened by the decision, who's benefiting from the decision, and ultimately try to make sure that we're, we're doing our best to define the problem and make sure that all the stakeholders that the decision ultimately impacts or influences are at the table. And that's at the root of the accessibility program. How the port thinks about accessibility is we look at what the customer needs are. So that's in the form of customer feedback, what are trends, and we evaluate how we can incorporate those items into our facility. The questions are constantly being asked, should we do this better? What would work better for you? And there's, they wanna be sure they're getting it right. Understanding and acknowledging that everybody's journey is different. So whatever that journey looks like, make that journey the best possible journey it can be for that individual. There's so many different areas that have been adjusted and, and modified in a way that makes the guest experience better for all airport users. The airport has been making some important changes to make the airport friendlier. Uh, for example, there's going to be a caregiving bathroom. A person of a different gender can go in and help someone. Not everybody thinks about what it takes to fly when you're in a wheelchair or a walker or you have some kind of disability. The other thing that's exciting is some of the signage is changing to make it more visible to people with lower sight. As a parent of a disabled child, we're doing everything we can to avoid a meltdown. It's not fun for my daughter. It's not fun for the people who experience it. It's definitely not fun for the parents. And so to have a place that if we need to take a little bit of a break and kind of calm down is really important to us and helps us to access travel and seriously decreases the stress level we experience. To know that I can get somewhere on my own or have access to resources that other people readily have, it's the greatest feeling of independence you can possibly have. It's important to have community feedback. It's important to listen to your users. That is, I think, the foundation of what makes us a top airport. I think it's a game changer for the whole city because it's a model that can be used for other businesses, for other organizations. And of course, we would love to see other airports get on board. But the great thing is we know PDX has been and is still working to be a pioneer. 
correct. Um, thank you, Madam President. With that, I will conclude my remarks this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Curtis, for all of that. That was great. And I have to say, as someone whose uh, parent uh, has low vision and, and travels through the Portland airport on a regular basis, I really appreciate that work and the inclusion of, of the community um, in coming up with solutions. So thank you for that. Um, any questions or comment? Yeah, thanks. Um, it is great to see that. I just hope in addition to the customers that the passenger service assistants are also requested to give input. They're the folks that help a lot of people in wheelchairs or with other abilities that need to be able to be moved around the airport because I know that they have a lot of ideas on how to make that better. All right, I'll call for motion and second for approval of the executive director's report. So moved. Thank you. Any uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Thank you. And I think I see Commissioner Strader on the call now. Uh, we didn't receive any public comment uh, this month, so we will move on to the general discussion item. Um, and I'll invite Chris Neal to introduce it. Good morning, commissioners. In a moment, we're going to talk about a different side of construction that we normally don't talk about, and we probably should talk about it a little bit more. It's no question that Hoffman Skanska has a fantastic safety record out there, and we're all proud of it, especially while building that iconic roof that Curtis talked about, and I will definitely do a little bit more talking about a little bit later. But on top of that, Hoffman Skanska has gone a lot further with just more than just safety, and that's mental health uh, wellness. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. When you walk up under that roof, it's important to think about the men and women that are out there in the middle of the night, literally, because we can't do it during the day most of the time, that are out there for 12 hour shifts. They're away from home, they're away from family, friends, et cetera. And they're dealing with some of the same things that you and I and everybody else in the world is dealing with on top of that risky, uh, that high risk situation dealing in construction. So Hoffman Skanska has decided to do something about it and I'm very proud of it. So it's my pleasure to introduce the vice president of Hoffman Construction and the executive on the project here with TCOR, uh, Dave Garski, to talk a little bit just about how to get us there safe. Dave. Great. Good morning, everybody. Okay. There we go. How's that? All right. Um, yeah. So thanks for the introduction. Um, like Chris had said, we've worked almost two or 3.2 million craft hours to date. And that's a lot of hours, a lot of um, different times, a lot of challenges, a lot of complexities. And we're really proud of what we've been able to do on the safety side on this project. But we're always looking for ways to be innovative and to improve it. Um, one of the things that we are doing is our company has created a program called Guts, which is get us there safely. If you can be 10 stories up on a piece of steel, you can be tough enough to maybe stop some work if you think it's unsafe. You can be tough enough to talk about mental well-being. You can talk about other things. And that's part of the program that we brought to the joint venture. Um, specifically today, what I'd like to talk about is the Guts trailer. The Guts trailer was open late January. Uh, we had a big safety lunch, about 700 people showed up. And what we'd like to do today is kind of talk about why that's important. Um, our safety program has really grown from just the physical safety to the psychological safety and the mental well-being. And we find with physical safety, we have gloves, we have hard hats, we have safety glasses, we have other things. But we're learning we need to bring other resources to the table to help people with mental well-being, as an example, help to prevent suicides, deal with depression, anxiety, and a lot of other things that not only we deal with as a society, but our workers really deal with in a very difficult, complex environment that they do day to day. Um, it's not uncommon that in the construction industry, you're asked to check your feelings, your emotions, and your problems at the gate when you walk in, but also they're checking their feelings, their emotions, and their difficulties from the job at the fence post when they go home. So they don't have a place to go, a place of rescue where they can talk and have community and have people together where they can deal with a part of the safety aspect that we have not dealt with very well as an industry over the years. So what I'd like to show you is a guts video, uh, give you a little bit idea what the trailer looks like. It looks a little bit like a rec room. It's intended to be that way because it plays a place of community, a place where people can talk, 
a place where people can listen and people can have courage and a place to even just kind of gather your senses and get your head straight to go back to a difficult and very dangerous job. So if we can play the video, I'd like to show you um, kind of the background on what we're doing. In conjunction with Hoffman's Guts and Toughen Up to Talk program, we wanted to create an environment that fosters an ability for people to learn how to communicate with each other on site. We wanted to start breaking down the stigma of mental health and talking about that and the well-being of our workers. So part of that is knowing that most people have two lives. They have their home life and they have their work life. And when things are not going so well at home, we bring that to work and potentially that creates a hazardous situation for us. So we wanted to figure out how we can start to communicate with each other of what's happening outside of work and how it works here. When it was presented to us, it was an opportunity for a room with one or two people communicating. And for myself, I didn't see that as something that I would ever use. So we came up with different ideas that we could learn how to communicate, how I normally would communicate. So it's evolved. It's become this rec room. You would almost call it a community center that we're building out here. And so with that, I'd like to offer some direct testimonials of people that are using the guts room on site. This room is spectacular. I'm in a 12 step program and I choose to live far away. So I have a long commute. We uh, work long hours on the job. And so it's hard for, for a guy like me to, to be active in my recovery program. And with this room that Hoffman's put together, uh, not only do we have the ability to connect and like play these cool games, but also we have a 12 step meeting um, twice a month in this very room where we're able to build on the foundation for our, for recovery, you know, and it's, it's literally a lifesaver for a guy like me. You know, sometimes people choose to have a permanent solution to a temporary problem and it, uh, it can be alone. You can be alone. And you don't have to be that way. We can do this together. And Hoffman is providing a place like, like this room here for, for us to communicate and connect. Yeah, it's a great room. It's just a very pleasant place to be. So when there's ever a time, and I've talked to guys on the job, that they just need a few minutes to go, this is a good place to do it. It's great just to know that the resource is available. I personally have been in the guts room a couple times for a few minutes, but it's more of just the idea that I know if I need to, where to go. I would love to see, you know, a day where this program and this access to all this help is everywhere because it's, it's needed. It's very important. Personally, I've uh, struggled with mental health uh, problems and um, I think it's just nice knowing that people are making an effort and people are focusing on mental health issues. It's nice to feel comfortable and feel like you can go to people whenever you can. And that's what I feel like with this room is that I can, if I'm ever having an issue or a problem, I can come here and just cool off and relax and take a break and, you know, let loose. When we started down this road, I had no idea what to expect. Uh, we didn't know if it was going to be a slow start fast start if it was going to take three days, six months for people to catch on. What's blown me away is the spontaneous meetings that have come out of this, the camaraderie that you can already see. It, it's quite amazing. People are comfortable uh, talking about their mental health, talking about their recovery, discussing their home life and the trauma that they're recovering from all sorts of things, cancer and their spouses to literal drug, alcohol, uh, recovery. It's just amazing to me to watch the people leave their islands and reach out for life preservers and their coworkers and now friends. We are tough enough to talk. This is making a difference and we are making a difference. You know, I think the biggest thing I would want, I want to say is it's okay to do for you. You know, we, especially us men, we do for everybody. We're in this trade. We work hard. 
We bring home a good living. We provide for our children, our families, but we don't provide for ourselves. It's very difficult to do in this industry. So I, if there's anything I can say right now, is just take some time to think about you and what's good for you and take advantage of this room. And for me, I've been able to do that. Therapy is something I've never sought out. That's something I've never asked for, but it's something I've needed a long time. And now I can do it. But more than anything, just remember, this is for you. Take advantage of it. I am. I love that video. It makes me very emotional every time I watch it. Um, the Gus trailer here at the airport is our fifth one for the company. First one with our JV. Skanska has been very supportive as we do this. Um, it gets emotional for me because... The big thing I'm here to do is prevent suicides. Um, I lost my brother last year. He was a Hoffman employee of 27 years. Our company lost three people to suicide last year. And it's something that was not only unexpected, but uh, to me, it's just horrible. And anything we can do as a company, as an industry and a society to help people that are dealing with this, that are struggling and with the testimonies that you saw, this is needed. And it is something that I am personally, you know, trying to be vulnerable, be open, break down the stigmas you know it's, mental illness is not a dark place it is not something that should be hidden it's not something that we should, we should not talk about these videos these testimonials and this need is real and i'm glad that we can bring it to the airport and i appreciate everybody's support that concludes our general discussion item are there any questions No, just I'm blown away and inspired and thank you for the support uh, that you're providing for your teams. It's it's incredibly important. And when you think about, you know, from veterans, I'm sure you have a high degree of veterans uh, among the people employed there as well. Uh, this is just something across society that uh, that we're seeing. And um, it, it makes me proud that uh, we're conducting uh, work uh, like like you are with the partners like you that care about the health and well-being of, of the workforce. So thank you for that. Mr. Alexander. Yeah, I would also offer um, appreciation because this is not a message that is very easy to introduce. And I have a very close friend who's doing some work with you. And we've always said you can't fix what you don't face. And this is very challenging. And we understand that there are lives that are impacted here. And this is a very positive presentation. But as you mentioned, the spectrum of exposure and risk takes you to a very dark place when you begin to lose people who don't see hope as a part of their path forward. So thank you very much. We heard about this on the tour um, that we had in December. And at, at that time, I was just thankful that, you know, as a company, you would take this on. And I think um, all of the testimonials spoke very well about the benefit of it. But in particular, the gentleman who said, I've never felt like I had a place where I could go or someone to talk to. And this provides that for me. And I think particularly in the construction industry, that's very, very true. And if you can get your workers to be there and supporting each other and saying it's okay to come and talk, um, it's just, it's fantastic. And I, I hope that the, I'm glad you're here today to make the presentation and I hope the, the word and the effort can be spread um, to other places as well. So thank you. Keep it up. Thank you, Madam President. These mics are really loud. <laughs> They're kind of surprising. Um, thank you so much for the work and um, especially in an industry that we don't think about really paying attention to this. So really appreciate the leadership and the work on that. And I hope that especially as we're looking at the at the port planning at PDX, um, we think about for all employees who happen to work on port property, a lot of them have small spaces or lease small spaces. People are working out of those that we're thinking about how every person that's working on the port property has access to a place to eat, to get warm. A lot of them, you know, are also working outside space for some mental health and reflection and to worship. Um, I think those are things that are right now not available to everybody working on the port property. And I hope we can kind of look at this as a model to make sure that's true. Maybe one thing I can add, um, we are working with Lions for Life in the Construction Suicide Prevention Partnership, and there are other people from Intel to even my church that are looking at the same type of things for their employees. Um, and I do think that there is a need there. 
So, you know, if there are resources out there that can help and things that we're doing to try to help spread the word to make this something that gets to be more common in more places. Thank you both so much for the presentation. Amazing work. And I, I'll just lift up what the other commissioner said uh, in gratitude for uh, providing it, for thinking of it, um, and for investing in it on behalf of the employees. Thank you so much. Um, we have a, a consent item, and um, we'll ask first if we uh, any commissioner needs a presentation. The title of the consent item is Designation of the Port of Portland's Representative for Urban Flood Safety and Water Quality District. Does anyone need a presentation? Okay, any comments before we move to a motion? Madam President, I would like to offer just some comments. I don't need a presentation. I certainly applaud the uh, participation of the port and the representation of Emerald Bogue on the um, the urban flood safety and, and quality district project. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't reflect during Black History Month that the absence of such a program in 1948 resulted in the flood that destroyed Blandport and displaced many people um, within this region. and. For us to now have the opportunity to bring together municipalities and approach this in a way that had we approached it in 1948, we would have had a very, very different impact within the region and particularly within the African American community in Portland and, and Vanport. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge that it would seem remiss if we didn't sort of look at this historical significance of such a commitment and the ability to bring together economic development and social justice around an issue like this. So I just appreciate the opportunity to offer a few words. Thank you very much. And I uh, will add to that and say, I appreciate that the port will be coming to those discussions with its new frame um, of who is burdened, who has benefited um, in thinking about decision making in a, in a really different way than has historically happened in our region. So thank you for that. Uh, with that, I'll call for a motion and second for approval of the consent item. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Motion carries. Um, we have several action items. We'll start with Keith Levitt to introduce the first agenda item. Good morning. Is that on? Hello. OK, there I am. Uh, and Commissioner Alexander, thank you very much for those. Uh, and we'll relay that to Emerald as, as well. I know she'll appreciate that. Uh, so Terminal 2, I know we've we've been speaking a lot about this. It was great to uh, take some some tours yesterday. Come on up, Tom Cody, our developer, uh, who I'll introduce more formally here in a moment. But uh, I think you all know that we're we're really reimagining, re-envisioning. The, the last year has been a whirlwind of planning and visioning that included getting uh, kind of under the radar was a $5 million uh, legislative appropriation to Hacienda CDC to go about building mass timber prototype housing that you all got to take a look at the exciting uh, progress that's being uh, made in one of our warehouses um, out at uh, Terminal 2. Uh, so that work is now becoming real uh, and we will be delivering with ha Hacienda will be delivering to various communities, uh, particularly communities that were uh, hit hard by the forest fires from a few years ago uh, with these modular mass timber built housing units. And this is really to innovate in that whole mass timber sector but it's also to in innovate in the modular housing sector so while that was going on we were working on our build back better grants with the oregon mass timber coalition huge vision around putting oregon in the forefront of that industry uh, sector with t2 being kind of the the linchpin of of that whole grant application and we won one of only 21 uh, projects around the country uh, started as a group of over 500 projects. I might have that number a little off, but yeah, close to 500 
project. So pretty amazing uh, victory that went on all of last year. And quietly during that time, uh, Tom Cody, who is a well-known uh, developer with an incredible track record in this community for doing great projects, who's been doing a lot of the kind of shared prosperity work that that we're now trumpeting, but has been doing it uh, in his companies uh, over uh, the last several years, very patiently and persistently was talking uh, with us over the last year and a half or so about, wouldn't it be great to do his vision of modular uh, housing, not so much mass timber based, but we can learn a lot from the kind of factory built housing uh, that is being envisioned now in one of our other warehouses, Warehouse 205. So uh, it, it for, for quite some time, it did not feel like this was going to become as real as it is. And it has been uh, amazing to get to this point now where uh, we bring this lease to you. For the port, uh, it gives us an opportunity to generate revenue and activate an asset that otherwise we probably wouldn't even have called an asset. We would have said that eventually is going to have to get demolished uh, for us to build out this broader vision. So I'm I'm just very excited to have Tom here and sitting next to us. Um, so Tom Cody uh, from Mosaic, and they have now stood up an LLC called Modami. And I'll, uh, with no further ado, let, let Tom introduce his company, and then I'll come back and introduce Sharif for the agenda item. Okay, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. It's uh, and thank you, Keith. It's great to be here. I feel like my whole career in city planning and 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 real estate outcomes driven real estate has kind of been on a farm team, and I I feel like now I'm getting called up to the major leagues to try to solve what is a a giant problem that our our nation and here regionally our state is dealing with, which is of course a housing crisis. So we have a specific uh, formula that we've devised to, to, I think, step up and answer the call to providing housing at scale for middle-income families, workforce housing um, for middle-income families. And I'm, I'm so happy that I think one person's trash is another person's treasure in a way. And when we saw the buildings uh, at T2, the existing buildings, uh, we've kissed a lot of frogs and it's very difficult to find buildings that are suitable for manufacturing modular housing at scale. And the buildings that you have at Terminal 2 are, are, are incredible in that regard. They have uh, large uh, clear spans. They have uh, adjacent available uh, yard storage area for modules when they're completed. They have very large overhead grade level doors that, so that modules can, and materials can move in and out. And it's a great location that's um, well served by infrastructure. Um, so we're, I feel like we kind of uh, hit the lottery in that regard. Um, so I'm going to say a few words about, uh, about Modomi, which is our modular housing, middle income housing program. Um, first, it's, it's vertically integrated, which is very unusual. We've spent three years studying the problem. Why does housing take so long and cost so much to build? Um, so we spent three years studying that and um, um, having vertical integration is an important part of it. And really what it does is it combines the manufacturing function with the a capital function with a development function so that the factory can operate consistently and efficiently with a captive source of demand. So the development company is, is well capitalized with a capital component and that is feeding demand to the factory so that the factory can run consistently and efficiently building the same thing at scale. Um, I don't know if we're, are we flipping through slides? Um, yes. Uh, I, I don't have the power. Let's, let's go forward. Um, there we go. One, and, 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 and so why, on the question of why does it, it take so long and cost so much, we've, we've done a lot of discovery on that and we've devised a program that's designed to deliver uh, housing 35% less cost and 40% faster. Um, obviously, I think most of you know affordable housing, capital AH, is typically 60% and below 
and market rate housing is considered 120% of AMI and above. So we're targeting this middle income band, which is essentially 60% to 120% of area median income. And that's really the heartbeat of our Oregon economy. Those are teachers, um, uh, childcare providers, um, construction workers, people like that. So we're very excited about um, providing supply um, intentionally to this middle income. We also have a partnership with Oregon Housing and Community Services. We have three sites that are the initial sites for Modomi, and one is seven and a half acres in Jackson County um, in, in the wildfire impacted areas. So we're exciting to be, excited to be deploying um, the second site, uh, deploying Modomi modular units to helping to answer uh, the need for, uh, for housing for people displaced by the wildfires. I think we can change the slide if that's possible. Um, we have uh, our phase one is targeting Oregon. We have our first site is in, in Bend, Oregon, next to that county, which is Deschutes County's largest employer, which is St. Charles Medical. They have a desperate need. Housing, you know, has, has gone off the charts in terms of its cost, both rental and for sale housing in that county. And so we're excited to be working immediately adjacent to St. Charles Medical. We have a, a site where we'll, that'll be site number one. The second site I mentioned is in Jackson County in Southern Oregon. And the third site and the primary target market will be in the Portland, Vancouver MSA. And the third site is in East Portland in the Gateway Transit area. We own five acres in Gateway. So we're already beginning to develop the pipe, pipeline that will fuel the factory. Um, we're intending, we're very excited about the workforce training and development opportunities. Factories are very different than traditional site built construction sites. We have the opportunity to create a very welcoming and inclusionary environment, have a higher degree of minority and women participation in a factory than you typically have on a site built uh, construction site. So we're very excited in, uh, about partnering with the port as well with the workforce training component that you have programmed for Terminal 2. Um, and that it feeds beautifully into the fact that we're going to be hiring 40 people in our first phase, which is this year. And then we anticipate starting full production the first part of 2024. So, so this year will be fit out, uh, hiring, safety, training, and then uh, we'll be ramping up to 90 jobs uh, by year two. So we're very excited about that uh, aspect of the partnership as well. Um, with that, I'll conclude and make myself available, of course, for any questions and, and comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Cody. Any questions for him? I'm just curious. It doesn't have to do with the lease, but so what would one of these properties market for? And is it, are they buying the land and, and the home or are they just leasing? How, how, how will those arrangements work and, and what is that pricing? Yeah, this is, this is um, targeting. So obviously we're targeting 60% to 120 of AMI. Uh, very immediate income, but that, you know, a hundred percent. So we're trying to be affordable to people making a hundred percent. We have some units that, that are below a hundred and some depending on where we're building that are between a hundred and one twenty. Um, but it's very important to note that really what happens is people spend too much of their income on housing, typically over 30%, they have to drive too far, live too many people to a, to a unit, erodes quality of life, the ability to care for your children, et cetera. So by targeting these incomes, we're providing sustainable inclusionary housing to people that, you know, don't have nobody otherwise supplying housing to them. So that varies by county, um, what that median income level is, but essentially for a one bedroom apartment, at 100% AMI, it's about $1,200 a month, generally speaking, in the Portland, Vancouver MSA. Um, and these communities are, uh, are uh, large in scale, 150 units or more. They're all rental housing. So they're intended to be a place where people can land, build wealth, and then kind of climb the ladder towards home ownership and building equity. 
Commissioner Sampa. First, <clears throat> uh, thank you for uh, the work you're doing in partnership with the port. Uh, we're very glad to be able to do this and to you know take our industrial lands and repurpose this toward economic development and a very important problem of housing. Um, I hope your venture is wildly successful. Uh, question, this is a broader question, is uh, does this become a broader trend? Do we develop a perhaps an industry cluster around manufactured housing? Uh, and how, how do you see that as an urban planner and developer? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I think that's very important. We've already been sharing experience with experiences with Hacienda, and I think they are the, the kind of pioneers at Terminal 2. And, and uh, But I think what you see in other, like in Boise, there's a cluster, a kind of ecosystem of modular housing suppliers there that have tended to kind of, um, you know, propel each other forward. And I think we do have that opportunity at Terminal 2 and here in, in, in Oregon and in Portland. Our program, because it's using resources, timber resources from our backyard and kind of showcasing them in the cities in our front yard, I, and it is lightweight wood, Oregon wood construction, I think it complements very well the mass timber uh, components of the other mass timber oriented uh, partners that you've organized for Terminal 2 um, and can provide some early learnings by actually getting an assembly line manufacturing process up and running at scale that the other partners will learn from and, and that can be built upon. But that that's our goal is that this is catalytic for to create an ecosystem of 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 multiple suppliers in Oregon because it, it's going to take a village, not just one person or one company can can answer the 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 full uh, call of uh, of the of the crisis. Thank you, Commissioner Oxen. Um, always a pleasure to be in the same room, um, and and that's that's determined by just the work that that you've been involved in. Uh, it was very gratifying to sort of see the the port um, and your organization sort of identify yourselves as fellow travelers in this work coming to it very differently. The Mass Timber Project and then the science of modular development, sort of allowing one and one to equal three with us. And so I, I hope that that will continue and the base of knowledge will continue to grow and shared across partners. Um, I'm also very interested in hearing about the work of Modami. Um, the fact that it's targeted towards rental units, I think is critical. The question that I have is as these communities begin to look at the need to move from rental to home ownership. Are you partnering in environments where that's seen as also an opportunity of leveraging your work? Yeah, I think that's a good call up. I feel like there's all these, you know, kind of very quickly we want to move to after we start up the manufacturing aspect of it, which is, of course, foundational. We want to quickly move to leveraging the full potential of, you know, the workforce training attributes, the potentially uh, shared savings plans or things that can kind of incentivize and build in things in our management of the community's process that can incentivize our, our residents to begin to build wealth and, and make that transition, which is so important and so difficult uh, to do in, in, in modern society. So I think that's a, a, a good call up for us and it's something that we're tracking, but no, the, the honest answer is no, we have not uh, established those necessary partnerships yet. I feel like another one, a different one is the resilient community aspect, like these communities with wildfire and, 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 uh, you know, other kind of catastrophic, uh, adverse events that that can impact um, housing there's a great opportunity for these communities to harvest energy to store energy and to provide alternative mobility options for people so that's one that another one that we're really excited to sink our teeth into and and begin to have clear actionable um, uh, outcomes related to but thank you for that call thank up. you yeah 
Thank you. I think if we can then have the presentation on the lease, that'd be great. Thank you, Mr. Cody. Great. So I'll have Cherie come on up and and join us. Uh, I think you well, you all got to meet Cherie Hosher yesterday. Uh, you know, Tr Cherie is um, a lot of this rebirth of Terminal Two is owing to Cherie's handiwork. Uh, she has been our property uh, manager out there for the last several years, and so it's very exciting. And and today is kind of her swan song in the properties team. She's moving just down the hallway to the government affairs team uh, to do more exciting work. And the good news is she stays uh, within the trade and equitable development division. So uh, we get to keep her, but uh, Teresa is not happy that Emerald stole one of her, uh, her members of her team. So go ahead, Teresa. Thank you. Can we, do I need to do anything for this? You're okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we move? There we go. And yes, thank you all for coming out to Terminal 2 yesterday. I think that's going to make this presentation very simple because you've been in the space, you know what we're doing. And thanks to Tom and um, Keith and the rest of the team, you know what we're doing it for. Um, and this lease to me is really pivotal because it really does establish Terminal 2 as mass timber and housing focused and keeping the lights on there for the last few years and seeing it underutilized um, has been tough, but I think we waited for the right thing. Um, and we went through this slide yesterday, but as you know, we've been looking for a great use for T2 and thanks to the Oregon Mass Timber Coalition um, and the EDA grant, we have found one. We can move to the next slide, please. Um, Thank you. Um, we were given $10 million to start the development of T2 into the campus. Uh, that is all probably going, it is all definitely going into uh, seismic upgrades, the buttress walls that we went over yesterday. And then $3 million is going into the port, um, creating a workforce training program. Next slide, please. And the master plan, as you can see, this will probably be moving and changing a bit as we get our um, all of our tests done and figure out exactly where these buttress walls need to go. Um, but um, as you can see, the, the white buildings in the middle, that's all the existing assets that we walked you through yesterday. Um, and we're hoping to build two large um, either mass timber or housing focused manufacturing um, buildings also to complement the work that will already be going on in the existing warehouses. Um, this lease is warehouse 205 up at the very top of the screen there. Um, and we can move to the next slide and we'll go over some of the specifics of the lease. Um, the warehouse, they'll be leasing approximately 89,000 square feet um, and three acres of yard for storage and lay down area, which is very important when you're creating whole houses, you need somewhere to put them. Um, it's 20 years total. The first 10 years um, is you know, settled. The last two five-year extensions will be upon mutual approval. The first year, we're looking around $525,000 of income for the port. And what's great about this deal is that Tom is willing to take on all of the tenant improvements. They're established developers. They have the crew. They have the manpower. They know what they're doing. Um, and they're going to put about $5 million of improvements into this facility to bring it from a warehouse to a manufacturing facility. Um, next slide, please. Um, also, what's very important for this deal, as we've talked about, is the, the cluster, the industry cluster. T2 is becoming a mass timber and housing campus. So having partners that are willing to contribute to the education, uh, to the culture of the campus, um, to help bring this industry along in Oregon, um, that is really important. And that is what Modomi brings. They bring an actual partnership. Um, we are having to be very flexible on both sides of the deal because this they're going to be renting a, a warehouse and the development of the entire campus is going to be going along going on around them. So we're doing our best to mitigate any impacts that will have to them and their business. Um, and they're being flexible with whatever um, changes come along in terms of the campus um, as it grows. So that is very important for a pilot lease out here at T2. All right, next, um, next slide, please. And that's all we have for you today. 
Uh, do you, does anybody have any questions? Thank you. I think that, I think the fact that we toured yesterday was really helpful exactly. um, in understanding both the what the vision and and the terms here. So thank you for that. Um, it, do we have a motion and second to approve the executive director's recommendation? So, so moved. moved. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Thanks a lot. And congratulations on your new role. Um, our next agenda item relates to the executive director's performance objectives for fiscal year 22 and 23. Um, you've seen these before, Commissioners, and they are on the back page of Agenda Item 3 in your packet. Um, Want to uh, make sure that we um, have properly reflected um, our uh, thoughts uh, for Curtis's objectives for this fiscal year, which were really built around uh, our strategic focus with respect to the port as a whole um, and his leadership role as he um, moves those objectives forward. So... I'm just open for discussion on the objectives if folks have any uh, concerns, uh, if you feel like we should have gone in a different direction, if these need to be um, massaged in some way. Again, they're on the back page of Agenda Item 3. Yes, Commissioner Luther. Uh, I don't have any, um, any uh, changes or comments or concerns, but just noting again that there are significant regional economic opportunities uh, in, and we talked about, you know, government affairs being a really important piece. And, um, you know, uh, to me, as I look at that, it's, it's exciting, but I'm glad to see it on the list and, and considering um, I think opportunities that are available that, you know, I, I'm happy to see that as a focus area. Thank you. Commissioner Alexander. I also appreciate it. I, I looked at the, uh, the ordering and we did have some opportunity to provide weighing in on this, and I think my first um, reaction was, gee, I'd love to see shared prosperity at the top of the list. But the reality is it's foundational to everything that's there. And in some ways, once you go through the specifics around each of the prior seven to anchor it within this work to say there's got to be fingerprints and evidence and movement and engagement. Uh, I thought the positioning was was well stated, but but I'm wholly supportive of the uh, objectives as they articulate. Thank you, Commissioner Koba. So Commissioner Alexander kind of brought up the question that I was going to ask um, that I didn't earlier, and I apologize for that. Do you do you see these ranked in order? So I, I, that was my question because I see them as all equal, and it may be worth putting a little footnote to that. Yes, I, I will. I can speak to that from my perspective, and welcome um, Curtis's thoughts as well. They're they're not ranked in order from my perspective, and I think when we do the performance. Um, review, it will not be weighted based on the how these are uh, ordered on the page. We These really are objectives that we intend for for Curtis to lead the port through each and every one of them. Curtis, do you have a... No, that's, uh, that's absolutely right, Madam President. You know what happened was we put them in alpha order and we put safety first. And then what happened was after a comment from a commissioner, we changed number six from mass timber to terminal two. And so now they're no longer in alpha, but we didn't change the order. So <laughs> th th they are meant to be consistent with uh, leadership language in the organization. Safety is first. It's threshold question. All of the others are going to happen. And I would put them in. I do think shared prosperity is foundational to what we're up to. Um, it was not intended to be in any sort of rank order, with the exception of safety being elevated to first through the door as everyone's thinking about being safe and getting home safe. So it may be worth just putting a little explanatory. Absolutely. Note or two Happy to do that. Thank you. Who picks it up. Then the only, I wanted to comment on a couple of them. First of all, uh, number four, COVID recovery and uh, employees' new work arrangements, which we all know everyone is struggling with. And we've talked among ourselves, certainly about um, the challenges of, first of all, sending everyone home and then remote or hybrid and those that, that can't work from home. And I think the importance of, be, of continuing to be sensitive to where, where all the employees are coming from um, and their different you know, experiences through COVID and, and their different, you know, 
personal situation, but at the same time, balancing that with, with a work environment that meets the needs of the organization. And like I said, the port's not the only one struggling with that. Uh, all employers are, and, and, um, but it's, it's definitely one to, to focus on spending the time and thinking about what, what is the optimal um, kind of environment for the port and, and how do we get there. So that would be comment number one. The, the other comment I have is on shared prosperity. And I know in my short time here and listening to my fellow commissioners, the excitement around shared prosperity and the opportunities for the port uh, itself, for the community and for the state and region and the world, if we want to uh, extend it that far. And, and so it is a huge lift. There's no doubt about it. But certainly the commission's commitment to that effort um, and doing everything we can to, to support the organization moving forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Sumput. Oh, we've had the opportunity to discuss this uh, in the executive committee. And so, you know, this is a reflects all our discussions. I think um, I like the fact that there are measurable results and we can look back and say this is uh, was done or it wasn't done. And I think it'd be uh, great to see this as a way of aligning the whole organization and there be objectives that go to the next level of leadership and all the way down. Uh, and that keeps of alignment of, you know, we're almost 500 person organization. I uh, want to make sure, Commissioner Strader, did you have any comment or concern about the objectives? No, no, I'm very supportive of and in, in alignment with everything that's been discussed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that discussion, I'll call for a motion and second to approve uh, the uh, performance objectives for the executive director. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Um, our next agenda item will be presented by Chris Neal. Okay, good morning again, two in a row. Uh, so our ask today is gonna be for IT infrastructure for uh, T-Core to enable the T-Core project along with other port IT stuff. And George is gonna talk all about that, not me. What I wanna talk about is highlight the employee event that Curtis mentioned earlier and how big of a deal it is. Uh, like he mentioned, over 150 people, 280 actually signed up. Every single slot that we offered got filled within a matter of a couple of days, just showing you how important it was and how excited people were to actually get out there. I also wanna highlight uh, the people that led it. Number one, Katie Meeker from our comms team, and then number two from construction, Brad Harrison, who was super excited to have random people walking through the construction area throughout the entire day. He was so excited about it. We're probably gonna do it once a week. Dave Garski agrees with that. <laughs> he doesn't. Um, I also wanted to highlight, too, that, you know, having them out there, having the concessionaires, having the tenants, uh, TSA, FAA, all the people that actually work out there looking at the roof, taking selfies, things like that. We thought that it was important to offer this opportunity that many people in this room have any, haven't even had because this project, as you all know, impacts them on a daily basis, whether it's noise because you can't do this thing quiet or it's dealing with passengers who are asking what this is all about, dealing with passengers, helping them traverse around the construction. We just thought that it was important to bring the community together to give them this sneak peek uh, behind the scenes, if you will. So some of the proud moments uh, that I thought that I wanted to share with you all out there. One, as you all know, we've traced the wood and everywhere that it's come from. So being able to point up to the skylight, which I know that a lot of you have seen, and tell them that this is from the Coquel, the, uh, Coquel tribe uh, and other areas that we've been able to trace the wood. That was very important to be able to do with them. And they were very excited about that. We also took the opportunity to do a layout 
of the of the area to show them exactly where the air, where the ticket counters are going to be, where the checkpoint is going to be, just to familiarize themselves with a little bit of what it's going to be, what it's looking like, how far we're coming along that most people won't get. And so it was very, like I said, sneak peek and something exciting that they all share. Uh, the other two things I'll, the other thing that I'll point out is they put together, we put together a big whiteboard, a couple whiteboards that the employees use as a uh, way to say thank you to all the construction workers out there. You all are doing a great job. Really appreciate the work that you're doing. We're so excited. Keep up the good work, et cetera. And that board was filled with little mementos and little notes to the construction crews out there. So I just thought that it was great. I wanted to make sure to give highlight and credit to where credit's due for the people that ran it and then to say in front of you all that Dave and Brad Harrison were really excited about it when I know that they weren't. <laughs> With that being said, I'll turn it over to George Seaman. Thanks, Chris. Next next slide, please. So, so today we're asking for about $2.7 million primarily to, to procure um, IT equipment for the TCOR project as well as some other, other port areas. Next slide. So I'd like to show some of the milestones, kind of talk about what's been going on in the project. I've got some some images, but right now the, the big thing is about getting the building enclosed. So getting it weather tight uh, when days like today, they're out there putting the roof on. Other days, they, they can't, but it's pretty weather tight, at least from a, from a roofing perspective now. Really a lot of work on the slab on deck. So you see some pictures of the of the steel work, and then it's building the, building the slab, building the, uh, the, the decking, and then building eventually um, slab on grade as we get through and then get the building enclosed to build the interiors. So by the end of the year, we're ready to put in the ticket counters. Next slide. Next slide, please. There's a couple of couple of pictures here. So uh, I think the last time I was here, they were we were just finishing the roof. So you look at the amount of work going on here. This was kind of over concourse C or uh, gate C4. Four, I think looking back at the construction site, just a lot of activity going on. It's kind of hard to tell from the from the image here, but you can see all the steel work being built for the mezzanines uh, in the construction activity in the in the area. Next slide. And this is an image from next slide. There we go. Uh, looking uh, kind of over where the 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 TSA checkpoints are. It's kind of held tough to tell but the slab on deck going in uh the the slab over over concourse d is now in that was one of the 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 big moves this decking as we move forward is is going as you see that on the left you see some of the some of the mezzanine so where the tsa checkpoints are going to be that slab's growing the team's putting in about about three to four major slab slab pours per week so the hope is by by about three to four weeks, we should get all the slab on the deck complete. And as we're working on doing the the, the current walls, starting on the north side. Next slide, please. So here, here's an image from the end of last month. Um, you can see the the slab going. In. But one of the things I wanted to point out is uh, you can see the the blocks on the ground there, and then the cables that are sticking up the roof. So that's pre tensioning the roof. If you remember, the roof is, or sorry, pre pre tensioning the curtain wall. The curtain wall attaches to the roof, so post earthquake it moves together. So in order to do that, the roof bent, basically bends. So we got to uh, uh, put the weight of what the curtain wall will weigh on the roof, figure out the exact dimensions, and then we'll, we'll pull the tension off. And then right before we put the curtain wall in, we're putting those, those, that, that tension back up and then put the curtain wall as we go and, and slowly remove it as we go forward. That's one of the big things going on. We should see the, the aluminum and the first curtain wall going in by the end of the month uh, on, the, on the north side. Next slide. So today, uh, kind of the mundane part of it is for for, for IT. So we're installing about 1,800 devices will attach to the network, anywhere from CCTV cameras to the access control points to the the FIDS monitors, paging systems. All those get tied into the to our network. Today, we're procuring the network gear to tie it all together. Recognizing it's a pretty big procurement, it's about two million dollars for TCOR itself. We combined it with other port purchases to get some economies of scale as we went through this. So there's some common use systems as well as renewal of some of the IT equipment that's combined with that that are funded outside of the TCOR portion of the project. Next slide. 
Big picture on schedule, we're, as Curtis said, we're tracking to a May of 2024 completion for phase one. So we're on schedule for that. Uh, and then an end of 25 completion for the nodes. Uh, we anticipate being back here over the next couple of months for an amendment for the ZGF contract for construction administration. I think we were back here at the end of last year the, for about four or five months for ZGF. I'll also be back for uh, uh, the grant funded for the ground source system in about, in about two or three months. Next slide. From a budgeting perspective, we're tracking the budget. Uh, we used a little bit of contingency, which is anticipated as we go. I think when we originally, or probably a few months ago, we we're about 110 million. We're spending right what we anticipated. Uh, this commitment for about $2 million for the IT equipment was within our budget and it was budgeted in the project. And it's really covered in the procurements equipment line of, of the budget. Next slide. Staff recommends the approval of the contract with CompuNet. And are there any questions? Commissioner Luther. Um, thanks for this. It's, it's exciting to see the milestones as they rack up. I think um, everyone's really excited. Um, when it comes to IT and the uh, installation, all of these things, I, I, it always makes me nervous. There's a lot of complexity in, in, in IT installations. But I guess my, my question is, given that there's a lot of investment going on here, is there a plan um, around cybersecurity? And as, as you're implementing a lot of Introdu introducing new things into uh, the complex network and given activities uh, that are out there and the vulnerability uh, and the, I guess, access to really important systems. I'm just curious about whether cybersecurity or in additional security is, is folded into any of this and, 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 and maybe a, you know, a note to self that uh, kind of understanding cybersecurity plans would be something that I would have a uh, you know, curiosity about going forward um, to understand how that impacts the, the network security here uh, at PDX. Uh, yes, we are. I'll let Chris answer this part. No, I won't let Chris. All right, we just put some of our IT brethren in the back and really dive into whatever details you want. Okay. Uh, or maybe that'd be worth uh, some future. Yeah. It is what I was about to say is that we should certainly, we haven't done it in a while, but to come to you commissioners uh, and talk to you about um the broader IT security strategy. I know uh, we talked about it, um, Commissioner Sampat, was that a year and a half or so ago, two years ago, I think you raised it. So we're probably due for that conversation again. And the project is integrated into that plan. Okay. So it's not yeah. a standalone. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a uh, designee from the IT team on the project mm -hmm. so that they're communicating and, and building in under that security umbrella. So I don't know, Chris, if you'd like to speak to that, but uh, I'll commit to you, Commissioner, that we'll come back and brief you up on our uh, current status and how it how the project fits in. Yeah, you covered it well. I'll also add, we just added an innovation director not too long ago that ties in the security along with a lot of other innovations for the future and who's also connected to the program as well. That's all I was going to add. Thanks, sir. Great. Thank you, because I know we've had conversation before as well in terms of t technology and making sure we're looking far enough out that what we're buying isn't going to be useless in a few years. So thank you for that. Could we just go back on the slides on the line items? Yeah. So back, I, back to yeah, no, that's that's. So if I'm no, you were there. The, the, yeah, we were in uh, on the uh, the line items. So if I'm understanding this correctly, this is both const, uh, procurement and construction because the biggest line item is the 1.6 million on. Yeah. Okay, so this is not just procurement. Uh, no, would, 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 this is the overall project budget. For the overall project budget, we've got a construction contract of about $1.6 million or billion dollars. Okay. Um, we will have a series of procurements we'll bring up. Some things the port buys directly. This was something that made sense from a manage, from a standpoint of making sure we were, we were consistent with what we were buying. But I've got that budgeted within the procurements equipment line item it was about two million we had budgeted overall from an it perspective about eight million dollars for the port to procure this is just a part of it and this is the okay, so first part but it, was, it is within the eight million it which is in 66 million procurement we plan to in two million for network year and that's what we're spending okay thank you 
So just to confirm, George, you're asking us to approve the $2 million in network yes. equipment procurement. Yes. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Okay, um, I will take a motion and second to approve the executive director's recommendation. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much. And the meeting's adjourned. Sorry, I'm so oh, sorry. Oh, we're out of the gate here. But I know. I turned the page too fast. No. We have a collective bargaining agreement, which is important. We need to get to it. <laughs> sorry if anybody felt like they were off the hook. We're back on. Uh, we have a con collective bargaining agreement. Thanks, Chris, for coming forward. And I think we have Blaze online. The time act to follow the T Core team because their enthusiasm is, you know, that that would be a great way to end the meeting. No, we're enthusiastic we about this too. We are. Um, so I'm standing. I'm Chris Arnecki, Director of Business and Properties at PDX, standing in for our Chief Operating Officer Dan Pippinger, who's mm -hmm. unable to be here with us today. Um, I'm going to introduce Blaze here in a bit. Blaze is our Manager of Employee and Labor Relations, and he's going to present to you a recommendation for a four-year successor agreement. Uh, collective bargaining agreement between the port and the District Council of Trade Unions. Uh, the DCTU represents our airport maintenance workers who do maintenance work at our three uh, aviation, our three airports, uh, Troutdale, Hills, Hillsborough, and PDX, of course. It's about 98 employees. Uh, and last year they had a series of um, negotiation meetings, 11 of them in total in 2022 uh, between April and November and uh, reached a tentative agreement in January, which was ratified just a few weeks ago. So with that, I'll turn it over here to Blaze, who will present you the recommendation. Thank you, Chris. Uh, appreciate that. Um, next slide, please. So good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, as Chris mentioned, it, uh, we're looking for approval on a, a four-year collective bargaining agreement um, with the DCTU, which consists of IBEW 48 electricians and Lyuna 483 laborers. Next slide, please. The key highlights on, on this agreement, um, four years, the first uh, wage increase is retroactive to July 14th, uh, 2022 um, at a 7%. Uh, and the second year, uh, uh, 7 13 2023, also at 7%. Um, this is fueled largely by uh, a CPIW of, of 6.0, uh, corresponding to that first year, and 7.6 in the second year. Um, the third year and fourth year are both uh, a minimum of 1% to 5% in those two out years uh, based on CPI West size Class A cities uh, second half. Um, also included in this is a uh, shift differential. The shift differential is not retroactive, uh, but rather goes into effect uh, subject to uh, commission approval. Uh, and there's an increase uh, 75 cents per hour on the second shift and uh, a 75% increase as well on the uh, third shift uh, per hour. Next slide, please. Um, there's a lump sum bonus uh, added uh, to this uh, agreement of uh, $2,500 uh, gross. Uh, all employees who are in a paid status uh, as of commission approval would be eligible uh, to receive that uh, gross uh, one-time bonus not added to base. Um, we also have increases in our uh, health savings account in terms of employer contributions. Um, the Fed has raised the uh, uh, ceiling on that uh, actually uh, three times in the last three years, I believe. And uh, so that we're we're tracking with that and we're going from uh, a $300 contribution to $500 uh, for employee only. Uh, we're increasing the port's contribution. Uh, again, these are annually uh, from $800 to $1,200 for employee plus dependent 
uh, coverage who has who have a, an HSA. And uh, uh, finally, they can also employees can also increase this uh, contribution from the port with voluntary participation in wellness activities um, uh, up to, uh, to an extra $200 uh, per year in credit towards this. Um, also, uh, we are increasing uh, life insurance for this group from um, 50,000 to 100,000 coverage. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, here's the estimated financial impact in new dollars um, for each year you see broken out. Again, this is just the increase in new money. And for years three and four, we are estimating it uh, there. Those amounts are based on if the CPI hit five or above uh, in those two years. That's uh, that's what the amount would be as projected to be. Uh, so when we give this total increase in new money, that's that's if uh, on the scale of one to five for those out years, it hit five in both of those years. Um, so that that would be the full estimated cost in new money would be uh, 3.6 million. Next slide. So again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're looking for approval to enter into a four year collective bargaining agreement with the District Council of Trade Unions. Any questions? Thank you. And I think, Chris, you said this has already been ratified by the employees. That's correct. On January 26th. Thank you. Commissioner Luther. Just a quick question and uh, just uh, commend the uh, focus on wellness for employees and incenting wellness activities. Just out of curiosity, um, I, I am curious of what those wellness activities or requirements are to achieve the, the extra $200. There, there are a very wide range of options that people can can do uh, in terms of activities. I can get, I can get you some of those, but they run the gamut, um, even including uh, things like um, uh, doing good deeds and that sort of thing. Uh, can you can get points and credit toward it in the point system that we have? Um, of course, all kinds of physical activities uh, would be available for that. But I can get you a comprehensive list. Um, it's it's pretty exhaustive as far as um, options that people have to earn credits towards it. Um, it's uh, very impressive, and I can I can provide that for you uh, certainly. Um, but it, yeah, everything from team sports to individual activities to dancing, et cetera, it really is a wide range um, of activities. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for a motion and second to approve the executive director's recommendation. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please aye. say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Motion now, carries. Now you now, can. Now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 